continue with Jesus' account of how the disciplines work. And in the last session, we looked in Matthew 6, uh, the front end of that chapter, at the Jesus' top-down account. Okay? And it focuses on this transition from focused, intentional action to it becoming the sort of thing where your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing and vice versa. Okay? Where it becomes habitual and automatic. Right? So, um, and in terms of, of those layers of the self in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Mark 12 that Jesus was talking about, um, that's the transition from heart to soul. Okay? Now, what we're going to do in this session is look at Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And in, at the beginning of Matthew 25, what Jesus does is he offers uh, now what I would call a, a bottom-up account. In other words, um, he gives us a depiction, a, a picture of the, the role that the result of this kind of intentional practice um, will have on our capacity to co-work with God. Okay? And um, so you can think about it this way. In, in Matthew 6, the assumption is that we're doing things where we have the time to think about it. We can, we can make choices. We can decide, are we doing this in order to impress people, or, or are we going to do this kind of as, as much as possible in secret to be only before the Father? Okay? Um, that's the kind of thing that we do in, in disciplines and practices. Okay? And kind of the distinction we want to make here is between, as it were, training or practice and what happens... If we extend the metaphor in a sports context, what happens in the game? Okay, it's the difference between practicing free throws and having to make it at a you know a critical moment in the middle of a game. Okay, and there's a connection between those two. They're they're different things, but there's a connection. Right now, um, in chapter six, the focus is on. Um, how we use the capacity that we have to practice. Here, what he does is he transitions and he says, okay, let me tell you why it's so important what we do with these disciplines in, as it were, our unpressured moments, in, in the time when we can reflect and we can choose. Um, it, that practice is essential because that, that practice is, is what's going to filter down to those deeper levels of soul, to what's unconscious. And it turns out that those deeper levels of, uh, of unconscious habit, of what's automatic, what we do on autopilot, there are moments when that will be what either enables us to co-work with God or prevents us from co-working with God. Okay. And the place where that happens is specifically in, in crisis moments. And so this is, chapter 25 is Jesus um, being just utterly realistic with us about the shape of human life. Okay, And the fact of the matter is that for every person, there are moments and sometimes even seasons of life where you're just too tired or things are happening too quickly to be able to effectively choose, mm. right? Sometimes things just come at you too quickly and you don't have time to deliberate. You don't have time to think about what's better, what's worse. And what happens at that moment is what's in your soul comes out, mm. right? You, your heart is too slow, <laughs> Right? That, that intentional, deliberative process um, is something that takes time. And it also takes energy. Right? And if either the time is too short or the energy is in too short of a supply, if we're too fatigued, 
we find ourselves in a position where we cannot effectively choose. And uh, let's just say, a great deal of, of the failure in human life, even the most traumatic failures, actually come from unchosen actions. It comes from unchosen actions. Now, after the fact, we'll blame ourselves, and, and in a sense, there is responsibility there, but we tend to over-ascribe it. We, we, we go back at ourselves as if we chose something, when sometimes we just kind of collapsed, <laughs> right? But here's the point of Jesus' teaching in this, okay? In those seasons, when we're worn out, Okay? And in those moments where things are happening too fast for us to stop and think and decide, guess what's still happening? The kingdom of God. Okay? Still in those moments, God's action, God's project is right where we're at. Okay? It's there in those moments as well. And because what we were created for was this co-working with God, this effectiveness in the world as we, we do things alongside God with him, um, it's incredibly important that we come to a place where even in those moments we find ourselves joining in and working with God, now in a way that's happening more because it's automatic, it's, it's deeper in us and it's happening automatically. Um, even though we're not able to choose at that moment, okay? Now, that's, that's what um, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the parable of the ten virgins is all about, okay? Um, it's set up, chapter 24 is talking about this crisis time coming, okay? And he's, he's speaking to his disciples about what's going to surround the destruction of the temple. Um, and, you know, the, the, this horrific, pressurized situation, right? And then he turns at the beginning of 25, and he says, in that time, then, in other words, in this kind of crisis situation, in this moment um, when it's, you're too tired and things are happening too quickly, then the kingdom of heaven, God's activity, will be like this, okay? Um, so let's begin by reading Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Um, and if somebody would just, uh, who, who has it, go ahead and read it nice and loud for everyone. And then we'll, we'll walk through it together. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry ran rang, ran out here's the bridegroom come out to meet him then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps the foolish one said to the wise give us some of your oil our lamps are going out no they replied there may not be enough for both of us and you instead go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves but while they were on their way to buy the oil the bridegroom arrived the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Thank you. Okay. So, with any parable, you have to start by reminding you what it's a story about. Okay. So, what is the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God? Um, well, we've already covered that. It is it's what God's doing. Okay, It's God in action. So, what that means is this is not a story 
about going to heaven or hell. We just need to say that out loud here because that is usually how this is read, right? The, the kingdom of the heavens is not a place you go after you die. Um, it's not something that is far off in some other place. It's what God is doing right where we're at. And, and just so you, you can put this in context, in Matthew, typically the phrase that's used, not exclusively but mostly, is kingdom of the heavens, which is a plural. It's the heavens, uh, not just heaven. <clears throat> um, whereas in most of the other gospels, it's usually, though not exclusively, kingdom of God. And the reason behind that, it goes back to, remember, we put these, these four letters up at the top um, uh, earlier. Uh, the, the Y-H-W-H, this name that the Jews didn't pronounce. Well, this is another indication that in Jesus' circles that um, Jesus himself didn't have his disciples pronouncing it. And so one of the things that the Jews routinely did, would they, su they would substitute words for that. <clears throat> so if you want to say the kingdom of this one God, you don't pronounce the name, but what you'll say is the kingdom of the heavens because that's where he acts from. He, his activity comes... We would say from the atmosphere around us. That's how we experience it. Okay, it just kind of shows up, and there he is working. Okay, um, and so, um, so this is a story about about God at work and what it's like to work with Him in these crisis moments. And and the the fact that it's a crisis comes from the context and Him saying, "Then it'll be like." Okay. Um, referring back to this kind of to the sort of thing going on in chapter 24. And so he, he tells his story, and you've got two types then of these people stand for people who are working with God, co-workers. So you and and both of them are virgins. And we just start by pointing that out. I, I think what that's supposed to tell us is that both of these um, groups are people who are morally upstanding, as it were. Right? You don't have one group that's pure and another group that's impure, right? It's not that these ones are morally serious and the other ones just don't care and they do whatever comes by impulse. No, both of them are, are living, you know, intentionally with purity to a certain, right? They're, they've got basic moral orientations that, that are, are spot on, all right? Let me point out, it also is not a story that contrasts, it's not that you have five virgins that are good and five that are bad. It's not five that are righteous and five that are wicked. What is the contrast? You have five that are wise, wise and five that are foolish. Okay. Now let me add to this word wise. The, the term behind this is, um, it, it's phronimi, right? Um, but it's... Um, the, the word for practical wisdom. So I gloss it as you have five that are practically wise and five that are foolish. That's, that's the contrast, okay? Um, the practically wise versus the foolish. Practical wisdom, um, so... We brought out a number of these, you know, like I said, the, the ancient Greeks had so many words for mind. <laughs> um, and so phronesis um, is a word that usually gets translated mind or mindset. Um, but what it has to do is how we deliberate about what we're going to do. It's, it's choices that lead to action. Okay? Figuring out what's possible, what's impossible. What's worthwhile? What's a waste of time? Right? Um, those are all decisions that are practical wisdom. Okay? So there's five of these virgins that have practical wisdom. Okay? They, they know how to operate where, well in this world. Okay? How th they know something about how things work. Okay? And then you've got five that are a little bit clueless <laughs> about you know, practically how to make things happen in the world, okay? Um, and so, um, 
as we think about the crisis moment, Jesus says now, when it comes to those moments where um, you're kind of on the spot, something has to happen this moment, and we're going to find out there's not time to think about it, it's going to come down to, um, you know, have we been practically wise or not leading up to that moment, okay? Now, um, so the ten come, they're part of a wedding, um, a party for a wedding feast, and they're waiting for the bridegroom to show up, but he delays, okay? It takes longer and longer, and I want you to, to notice here, all of the virgins fall asleep. The practically wise do not stay awake any better than the foolish. That's really important to notice, especially when we get to the bottom of all this, okay? It's not that one stays awake and the other does not, okay? Why? Because in this situation, what he's describing is just a feature of the limit. It's the limits of human beings. Everybody wears out. They're, everybody does. We, we kind of hit our edge, and we get to the place where we're so fatigued that it, it's beyond... It's beyond choice. We're incapable of choosing. Okay? Um, at that moment, then, what it's going to come down to is it says that suddenly in the middle of the night, there's a sound. The bridegroom has arrived. Come out and, and, and greet them. You know, bring them back in. And at that point, they wake up, and we find out what is the, the primary difference between these two. What do the... What did the wise have that the foolish lack? Oil. Okay, they have oil, but they have oil because they have something else, actually, more specifically. Now, we need to talk about the oil. It's important, and that, that's going to be an interpretive key. Um, but they have something, where, what do they have? The they have the vessels for the oil. Okay? Um, so... The difference is that those who were, as it were, thinking ahead, those with this kind of practical wisdom, they brought extra oil in, a, in vessels, whereas the foolish had, um, had no vessels, and thus no extra oil. Okay? Now, what Jesus is doing here is he is picking up a, a fairly standard metaphor that the rabbis have used. Um, and the, the metaphor is this, that the rabbis would very often um, tell their students, mix a little oil with your study of Torah, of the, the Jewish law, right? Um, mix a little oil with your study of Torah. What is the oil that they're talking about? The oil were good deeds. They, they were, or what we would call, practice. In other words, when, when they speak to their people and they say, mix a little oil with your study of Torah, they're saying, don't just think about it, don't just read it, put it into practice. Mm -hmm. Put it into practice, do something with it, right? And um, this comes from a number of places. One of the places that this comes out, um, and I've, it's... Unfortunately, I think it's in the, in, in the footnotes, but you'll have that in the PDF version. Um, there's a, um, um, in the, it's the, uh, the Song of Songs, we're called to, um, for, um, for, for oil um, to be poured on. And they say, what's the oil? Well, it's actually the practice. Okay? It's the bodily practice um, of these good deeds that are taught in the, in the Torah. Um, so it's a, it's a metaphor that's become, it, it comes out of scripture, but it's used over and over again in other places at that point. And so it's something that would have been recognized, right? That, um, and what, what it's referring to. Now, I want you to think about it. <clears throat> if oil is our practices, you think of these as the disciplines, the things like, like prayer and fasting um, and, and giving of aid, of help um, in secret that Jesus teaches about in Matthew 6. Um, 
if if the oil are those disciplines, those practices, what's what's a vessel with oil, with extra oil? Well, stored practice is character, right? Stored practice is character. It's it's all of that that has become habitual so that we would do it even when nobody's looking. It's what comes out when we don't think about anything. Right? Um, it's just, it's now automatic in our lives. Right? And so the difference between the wise and the foolish is that the, the wise um, have <coughs> this stored practice that um, has produced um, <clears throat> character. And it turns out that that's going to be what makes the difference in their capacity to, to join in with what God's doing at the moment, right? To, to come into the feast. Now, because this is a story about co-working with God, and we know that Jesus has told us that. It's about the kingdom of the heavens. It's about co-working with God. We can lift, we can lift it out of the parable for a minute, and we can, we can kind of compare it with other things Jesus has said about what it's like to co-work with God. And one of the places um, uh, that he describes this that I think is helpful here to remember is in John chapter 4. Okay? Um, in John chapter 4, verses 34 through 38, um, Jesus is, uh, he's been talking with the woman at the well. <clears throat> and you'll remember when they show up there at the well in Jerusalem, in Samaria, Jesus is absolutely worn out. He can't walk another step. He's hungry. He's tired. He just kind of collapses next to the well, and the students go to get food in the village. Okay? And when they come back, he's been having this conversation with, with the, the Samaritan woman, and he no longer is hungry. Okay? The woman runs into town, and at this point, he's no longer hungry, and they're like, what happened? Did somebody bring him food? Okay? And this is Jesus' explanation for what's been going on there. So go, go to math, I'm sorry, to John chapter 4. And if somebody would read for us, beginning in verse um, 34, um, all the way through 38. Um, and what he's doing here is he, he's actually describing that the moment of co-working that he's entered into, okay? Um, he's describing this, this experience of co-working with God. So somebody read for us um, John chapter 4, 34 through 38. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I have sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work. And you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me point something out here. Um, it's just an element of what he says. He, so my food, back in verse 34, is to do the will of him who sent me. And then he, he makes it more specific. It's, it was translated as finish. You could say complete his deed. To complete his deed or his work. Here's what that means. Okay, Part of the what we experience as we're working with God is we find ourselves in a moment suddenly okay, where things have been set up. We, we realize that, that um, there's a lot that's in place to, that moves in the direction of, of some project, right? some deed. And there's a little something missing that is just the size of what we can do. 
it's it's just it's just that size, right? A uh, a cup of cold water, a kind word, right? A, a helping hand, uh, whatever it is, right? It, it's and we we find that suddenly we're in a position where we've been gifted with the right moment, the right place, the right time to complete something that God has been doing, right? That's the experience of co-working with God, is of completing things that have been set up before we got there in many ways. And he, he goes on to describe this. He says, okay, um, and he uses this image of, of the harvest and of the, you know, the reapers overtaking the sowers and so forth. But he comes back and he says, look, um, you, I, I sent you to harvest that for which you did not harvest, uh, for you did not labor, I'm sorry, Others have labored, and you are entering into their labor, okay? Just like we enter into the kingdom of God or the work of God, part of entering into the work of God is entering into the work of the others that he has used, right? And so we find that that little bit before us that, that's, as it were, our size, our shape, right, for us to do, um, that's something that was set up because God has been doing things through lots of other people, right? And now there's this one little gap that you're in the right moment, the right place, and you can do it, okay? And so you get to enter into their labor. Now, of course, as you do that, that's also setting up something else and that somebody else is going to complete, right? Um, and so co-working with God, we find ourselves as kind of links in a chain. But here's the point of this. If, every, if others have labored, and we're now in the position to complete the deed, it means that things have been set up over time, and there's no rewind on time. There's no rewind on it. When God sets things up for that moment where now we get to work with them, we get to, to contribute our little bit, and it completes his deed, um, if we're not prepared to do that little bit at that moment, then the opportunity passes and it's just gone. Okay? And, and that is the, um, we can bring that back, that's the point that Jesus is, um, is, is bringing home in the parable of the virgins. Right? That there's, there's this moment when the bridegroom arrives, okay, where God is doing something right here, right now, and we're all in the place to do it, to join in that, okay? The wise are in the position to, to join in. They're, they're there at that moment, and the foolish, they're there at that moment, okay? But only some, only half of them are prepared to actually join in, and the others, they, they're, they're, they're missing the character to do it. Okay, they're, they're, they're missing the, the, the vessel with extra oil, the, the product of, those, of that practice. Okay? And because of that, they miss out on co-working with God in that situation. Okay? What does this mean? It's simply that um, in, in crisis, situa in, in situations where it's pressurized, it's difficult, we're all worn out and tired we cannot count on being awake on being able to kind of use our, our heart's focus and choose at the moment to co-work with God in some situations not every last one but in some situations it's going to really depend on what has become habit for us okay um, because it, it'll be happening so fast, then it's, it's all going to be reflex on our side. But what our reflex is, either because we've practiced when we weren't pressured, right, and had that character instilled to us, um, had it sink into our soul, or what our, char you know, our lack of character, because we haven't practiced, that will determine our capacity to complete that particular deed, to co-work with God at that moment. 
Okay, that that's the point of the ver of the or that's one of the points of the parable of the virgins. Okay, now, um, so that's what what it will depend on is the residue of our practice and character. It will not depend on us being awake, right? Because both the wise and the foolish are worn out, right? Now, have you ever, when you read this, thought, well, the wise virgins seem a little selfish to me, right? I mean, after all, they asked, you know, I mean, the foolish say, hey, let me have some oil. And I mean, Jesus says, you know, if you have extra, give it to your neighbor, right? Aren't they following, you know, what, what's wrong here? Are, aren't they being selfish? Now, you, once you get what the oil is, you'll know why it actually is the sort of thing that cannot be shared. When you talk about character developed through practice, that's by its nature not the sort of thing that just cannot be shared. You see, in that crisis moment, when it comes down to, um, am I patient enough to stick with this person to complete that deed? Okay. Now, that's about character. And I can't say, you know, I'm a little short on patience. Could I borrow some of yours, Dale? Right? It's, it's unshareable. Right? Um, if, it, if it comes down to... Am I, am I ready to, to bless those that curse me, to return blessing, um, to, to speak well to those that are being aggressive towards me, right? It, and that's come down, um, that, that's what's needed in order to complete that deed, to co-work with God in a pressurized moment. But inside of me, my character is, you know, to lash out and to fight back rather than to, to seek the good of the person screaming at me, then in that moment, I can't come and say, hey, Vangelis, you seem to be a pretty, you know, um, a, a guy ready to bless. I need to borrow some of your capacity for blessing. It, it's, it's not shareable. There's some things that I have to do for myself and you have to do for yourself, okay? It's just unshareable. And that's, that's what the oil and the vessels are. It's just the nature of what they're referring to is the sort of thing that's unshareable. Okay? In the same kind of way, like, I can explain something to you, but I can't understand it for you. You've got to, you have to grasp your own understandings. In the same way, I can't practice for you. Okay? You've, got, you've got to do your practice. I have, I have to do my practice. Okay? And so that's why, that's why the virgins don't share, because actually what this refers to is unshareable. Now, and because of that, the door closes as the foolish go to figure out, right? They're in the process of, they're going to deliberate, they're going to try to find the resources to address this situation. But what happens is the moment's passed. And co-working with God, it can only happen at the moment when God's doing it. Okay? So the closed door is actually, it's just pure realism. Okay? Remember that the word know in scripture means to interact with. To interact with. And so what happens is they come back and they knock on the door and they say, open to me. And what are they told? I don't know you. I I wasn't, I'm not interacting with you in this right here. What I had set up for you to do has passed. You didn't interact. You weren't there. Okay? You're, you're here at the wrong time now. Okay? Uh, the moment's passed. Now, let me come back and emphasize what we started with. What is this a story about? It is not a story about going to heaven or hell. So this is not saying... Sorry, you missed it. You didn't have sufficient character. You burned forever. Right? That's not what this is about. This, but what this is, is nonetheless, um, you know, it, it would be grievous to miss out on. Right? Because we're created for co-working with God. So I don't want to downplay the loss of not having the character at that moment. 
it, that's significant, but it's not, it's not the end of the story. It, there will be another moment because guess what? Where is God's kingdom? Right now. Right here, right now. Okay? So what, what do we do? We regroup and we work towards being prepared for the next moment, which is what Jesus concludes with here um, in verse 13. Now, it usually gets, so literally it's, it's be awake. Be awake, because you, therefore, because you do not know the time or the hour. Okay, be awake. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that the better translation, the way of understanding that, is him, what he is saying is, make good use of your waking time, because you don't know the day or hour. Okay? Now, throughout the ages, there have been people, starting from very early in, like, in the late 200s, early 300s, who read this in a very literal way as a counsel for sleep deprivation, okay? Of Jesus, say, for, for, for like literally never sleeping. Like try to live off of the, the least amount of sleep you can, you know? Try to squeeze it down where you're only sleeping three hours or something. Um, and, and you have whole orders that kind of focus on that, okay? Um, but I don't think that's what's going on here. And there's a couple things that we can we can see um, in the passage that makes sense of that. First of all, within the parable itself, the difference between the practically wise and the foolish is not that these guys stayed awake and these ones did not, right? The practically wise also grew drowsy and fell asleep. Okay? Just like the foolish did. Why? Because it's, it's, it's just the, the human limitation, right? We wear out our heart, our capacity to think and choose. It can only go so far, and then it's done for the day, right? It's done. And probably it's done right now. But anyhow, you guys are doing well. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so that's why what happens on autopilot matters so much. So what Jesus is saying here when he says, make good use of the waking hour because you don't know the day or the hour, is in those moments where you're not worn out, in those moments where it's not a crisis, think, think through it and make good use of those for the kind of practice that he's talking about back in Matthew 6. Right? Use the disciplines when you have the time for it because that will give you the character that will make all the difference when it's a crunch, when it has to happen now, or when you're, you're tired but God's doing something and we need to join in, okay? Um, so this is why the discipline, this is, um, again, how, the, how the, the, uh, the disciplines work is through the production of, they produce character in this way. But this is also why it matters so much, because it actually will either enable us to co-work with God in some moments, or it will be the reason why we're incapable of working with God in those moments. Okay? All right. Questions, comments? Project is over. But that, that particular deed, he's going to get there somewhere else. He's going to get there some other way. So God's project is going to succeed, but, but that moment's passed. You know, that, that's what it means, you know, and that's just, that's the nature of human life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think just, this is excellent reflection, because I haven't thought of it this way, but I think there have been moments where we miss, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make it personal, there have been moments I miss, mm -hmm. and I have failed to be honest enough mm -hmm. to, to recognize it. And then I'll rewrite history. <laughs> I'll create an excuse uh -huh. to to allow me to live with myself or to excuse myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I think that's another I don't know moment of honesty that I would hope. I think these these five virgins, you know, they, they at least there was the honesty of okay, let's go try let's to go deal with stuff. it. Yeah. But you know, then the there's. There's no room in this story, of course, for the excuses of why mm -hmm. and to excuse our missing the moment. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And here again, I think that's where the community can help, commonly mm-hmm. reminding each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also just, I need to be honest with myself, and yeah. I can't fix the moment I missed. No. Yeah. I need to be ready for the next one. Yeah, there, and, there's grace, there's forgiveness, you know, live forward, but yeah. live forward now with, with a little more wisdom, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to catch you. No, I just thank God for the church. Thank God for each other. Mm -hmm. That allows to empower that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen.